Everybody, why don't we start with a prayer? Let's call on the Holy Spirit. O heavenly ruler, comforter, spirit of truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, a treasury of blessing, giver of life, fire of God's love, father of the poor, come. Come dwell within us, enlighten, guide, strengthen, defend, and console us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church. Everybody, Helen Alvarez is a national treasure. We're so lucky to have her here at the Napa Conference this year. You know, when, when I was uh, a seminarian at the Catholic University of America, and she was at the Bishop's Conference doing pro-life activities, I had an intellectual crush on her. And I used, to, I used to follow her all around the District of Columbia and beyond to all of her talks and all of her book signings. I would show up in places like the Paulist Bookstore uh, in Old Town Alexandria. It's an amazing thing that she never took out a restraining order on me. <laughs> but she was such a cheerful warrior. She was so effervescent with love for the church, love for the unborn. Uh, she's been a great champion, um, and now, of course, of religious liberty, too. And she gave such a beautiful uh, talk on the church just now. It's amazing and a little bit creepy that I should be following her, don't you think? <laughs> As she mentioned, Helen lost her husband uh, last May. Um, she was 17 when she met Brian, and he was 20. They were married for 37 years. He was a pro-life champion in his own right. Uh, really beautiful. Let's take just a moment to remember Brian and to pray for the, the repose of his soul. I've been asked to speak on the food that gives eternal life. And I know that I'm not the best speaker that you're going to have this, uh, this conference. The lineup that Tim and Fran and Father Spitzer and John and others have put together is just astonishing. I was cracking up yesterday when the vice president, former vice president of the United States, uh, did this little litany where he said, you know, uh, cardinals and bishops and monsignors. And I was just a little bit ashamed of all of you that you didn't burst out laughing when he said, and my seniors. <laughs> there was a, um, a wise old priest in my diocese who said that my seniors are like box elder bugs. They have colored spots and no one knows what they're good for. <laughs> and so I'm not going to give the best talk of this conference, but I think I do have the most important topic because nothing touches our life as deeply as Jesus present to us in the Eucharist, the food that gives eternal life. And so I'm consoled by this. I open the program. I see that tomorrow morning at 8.30, there are three great breakout sessions that you can choose from. And among them is a breakout session by Archbishop Broglio and uh, Bishop Cousins on the Eucharistic revival. And so those two bishops are going to be batting cleanup for me tomorrow. And if I do a bad job, it's just to make those bishops look better tomorrow morning. <laughs> the food that gives eternal life. As I was praying with this daunting topic, it came to my mind that I've been a priest this month 21 years. 21 years I've been a priest. <laughs> Which makes me old enough to come to Napa and drink wine. And two memories from the very first days of my priesthood came uh, flooding back to me. My first ever anointing and my first funeral. I was maybe two, three weeks a priest uh, at the cathedral in Bismarck when a young woman showed up at the rectory and she said, Father, um, my Aunt Mary is a recluse. She's a hermit. Uh, she hasn't left her house in 20 years. None of us have seen her in 10 years. She lets us speak to her on the telephone, but she doesn't let anybody come in. She won't see a doctor, and she's very sick. And I was talking with her just yesterday, 
and she said that maybe she would see a priest uh, to get anointed. Could you go over? And so I went over to this little ramshackle house just a few blocks from the cathedral and knocked on the door and Mary called for me to come in. And I came in and the house was filthy. And she was sitting alone in a room, completely blind. She had been blind for many years. Her hair was matted. Her clothes were matted. She had a long white beard. She sat there staring into the distance um, with one of those Bose radios next to her playing classical music. Uh, one of the ones that Paul Harvey used to advertise on his show. And so I talked to her about her life. I talked to her about the hard times she had been through and her experience of life and of the church, her love for music, her fear about dying. And then I anointed her, and I heard her confession, and I gave her the Eucharist. And then we sat in silence together, and suddenly everybody, I'm not making this up, she turned and she looked at me. Even though she was blind, she looked at me. It, it was as though her eyes pierced through me. Her face lit up with joy and she said, Oh, Father, I had forgotten what life tastes like. Oh, Father, I had forgotten what life tastes like. But a week and a half later, I was called to the bedside of a dying World War II vet. And um, he had returned from the war. He was one of the great blue blood pillars of our community, an educator. He had taught generations of children. He had, he had run schools. But when I sat with him at his bedside, on his deathbed, he didn't want to talk about any of that. He wanted to talk about a young farm kid from Tennessee who was in his platoon in the war. They were in a foxhole together. And this young kid, which he had adopted as like his little brother, this young kid kept asking him, Frank, do you think we're going to make it out of here alive? Frank, do you think we're going to make it out of here alive? And he said that, that young man from Tennessee who was my kid brother, he didn't make it out of there alive. In fact, everybody else in my platoon was blown to smithereens, except for me. And he had lived with survivor's guilt all those years. But he took a deep breath and he said to me, Father, um... I've lived all these years, and now it's my time, and in a day or two I'll be with God and with all of them, and I've learned one thing. Without God, ain't none of us gonna make it out of here alive. Without God, he said, ain't none of us gonna make it out of here alive. The Eucharist, Jesus, really, truly, substantially present to us in the Blessed Sacrament, is the food that gives eternal life. It reminds us what God is. It reminds us what life tastes like. And it's the way that we're gonna make it out of here alive. The Eucharist is the food of the kingdom of heaven. I think it was Father Ronald Knox, that great English preacher who Notice that when Jesus speaks about the kingdom in the Gospels, he usually speaks of it in pairs of images. One image which touches upon the internal life of the church and its growth, and the other image which talks about how it affects the world around it. And so he says that the church is like a mustard seed, which is so small and which grows and grows, and only then after is it a home for the birds. But the church is also like leaven, like yeast that gets into the dough and that causes it to rise up internal and external. Jesus says that the church is like light and salt, light which is something of itself which grows and begins to glow and then the darkness flees in front of it and it's like salt, the kingdom, because it goes over food and brings out all of the flavor of it. The Eucharist is a mystery of our faith which touches particularly upon the internal life and growth of the church. This Eucharistic revival which we're in right now is a privileged time for all of us as Americans and as Catholics to tend to our inner life and to strengthen our belief in Jesus' presence in the Blessed Sacrament, 
in the Eucharist because worship is worth it, because it's worthy to do such a thing, to apprehend more deeply and to love more fully Jesus present in the Eucharist, and also so that we can then be more effective in evangelization in our witness of the life with God that we share to the whole rest of the world which so desperately needs that life. And it's always been this way that the Eucharist has touched upon the internal life of the church. It used to be, remember, in the early, early days that those who were not fully initiated into the Christian life weren't even admitted to the Eucharistic sacrifice. Catechumens couldn't be present. This is carried over in the Eastern rites in the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Remember, right before they receive communion, the people cry out, O oh, Son of God, admit me this day to your mystical supper, and if you do, I will not tell your secrets to your enemies. Admit me to your mystical supper. If you do, I will not tell your secrets to your enemies. The church receives its internal growth, its life from the nourishment of the Eucharist, and all of our energy comes from there too. Remember, Pope St. John Paul II every year would write to all the priests of the world on Holy Thursday. And um, his, first, his first full year as Pope in, on Holy Thursday of 1979, he released his first letter to priests. It's very beautiful. There's a place toward the end of the letter where he, um, where he talks, he addresses priests who are weary, who are experiencing burnout, who are wondering if it's worth it, who he says have kept their hand to the plow and have endured the heat of the day. And he says, when you feel worn down, when you feel like you'd like to throw in the towel, remember that there are places all over this world where there is not a priest, and so there is not the Eucharist. And in such places, from time to time, they'll gather in an old abandoned church and they'll take a stole which they've kept and treasured and they'll put it upon the altar and they'll gather together and they'll say all of the prayers of the Mass until they come to the time of transubstantiation and then they'll stop and silence will pierce the assembly. A silence which is only punctuated with a sob here and there, people weeping, crying out because they desire so much to have the Eucharist but can't because of the absence of the priest. And the Holy Father said, my brothers, such places are not rare in this world. The Eucharist, if you open up the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, the passage on the Eucharist features that quote from St. Irenaeus from his treatise against heresies in which he says that we attune our minds to the Eucharist and the Eucharist in turn confirms our manner of thinking. We attune our minds. The Eucharist exists such that we as faithful believers can come and receive nourishment of the mind so that we can grow in faith the Eucharist attunes our mind to the invisible world and confirms our belief, our way of thinking as Catholic Christians. Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, which was the first document issued by the Second Vatican Council about the liturgy, the same document which so memorably described the Eucharist as the source and the summit of the Christian life in the introduction to that document, the Council Fathers say that the Eucharist reveals the real nature of the true church. The real nature of the true church, which is both human and divine, visible and invisibly equipped, ready for action, but intent on contemplation in this world, but not at home in it. These considerations of the Eucharist show us that our belief in the real presence of Jesus can grant to us 
at least two firm foundations upon which we can base the whole of our lives. First, the nature of true faith and a fierce allegiance to the invisible world. And second, the real nature of the true church and an answer to the question whether in the times in which we live now, the church is going to survive. The true nature of faith, fierce allegiance to the invisible world, the real nature of the true church, will it survive? Starting with the question of the true nature of faith, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was canonized 700 years ago this month, St. Thomas Aquinas famously defined faith as a habit of the mind whereby eternal life begins in us, allowing the intellect to see that which is invisible. Faith is the habit of the mind where an eternal life begins in us, is born in us, where the intellect is able to perceive, is able to see that which is invisible. The Lord said something very similar to St. Catherine of Siena, um, which she recorded, in which God said to her that, that the intellect is the eye of the soul. And faith is like the pupil in the middle of the eye. And if it's shrouded, you can't see. Faith gives us the vision to be able to see the whole of reality. Without it, we're mostly blind. Without it, we can't see or perceive truly. It's the healing of our minds. It's the, it's the healing of our blindness such that we can see, such that our vision can penetrate past the veil which constrains us into the invisible world, which is true, lasting, everlasting. Not only that, faith also, faith also grants to us the determination to live according to that which we have seen. In other words, we can have fierce allegiance to that which we have perceived by faith. And it's important for us to live in this way. I have a litany for you about the difference between living with faith and living without faith. So, faith. Faith grants us the determination, as I said, to act according to what we've seen. So here's a litany, a kind of examination of conscience for all of us. When we judge a person's success by what has happened in this life alone, we are not seeing reality. We are acting without faith. When we think we can create our own world of justice and peace by our own efforts, we are seeing things humanly and not believing what God has said. When we value others according to their looks or money or accomplishments or positions of authority, we're seeing blindly without faith. When we view a human tragedy, a harrowing experience, a physical or emotional trauma as marking us forever instead of being temporary, we see inaccurately without faith. When we become overwhelmed with anxiety over the fortunes of the country or the world and lose our fundamental hope, we are seeing without faith. When we think ourselves alone and unheard because our human connections are faulty or dwindled, we're forgetting what God has shown us about his presence, and we are lacking in faith. When we put our hope and trust in something other than God's providence as our security in life, we're building our house on sand rather than on truth, and we're acting without faith. When we decide that it is for us to determine what is right and wrong because we really don't have any absolute standard given us, then we disbelieve what God has said and we act without faith. When we see the sins of our fellow believers in the church and we become discouraged and think that God is no longer present with his people, then we cease to view the unseen world and we act without faith. But when we act as though God is always present to us and within us, even when we can't see him, 
we are acting with faith. When we remember that we're meant to inherit heaven and unimaginable glory and beauty, then we act with faith, believing the promises of a faithful God. When we recall the coming judgment and attempt to live justly and charitably with that day in mind, we act in faith. When we recognize the presence of angelic and demonic beings and see that we are involved in a mighty struggle between good and evil forces, then we're applying faith. We're seeing truly. When we treat others, whoever they are, as immortal beings worthy of dignity, we are viewing them with faith. It was sometimes said that Mother Teresa gave new eyes to the world so that they could see the poorest of the poor. She saw in a dying and neglected person on the street a soul beloved by God because she was exercising faith. When we remember that we're never alone, that God is ever present within us and the angelic world surrounds us, that every word we speak is heard and every action we do is noted, then we see with the eyes of faith. When we pray, confident that God hears us and responds to us, we are taking him at his word and acting with faith. When we prefer the truths revealed by God about ourselves and the world to those formulated from within our limited experience, we believe the one who really knows and we practice faith. When we're willing to give up the loss of much that the world considers valuable so that we can better follow Christ, we walk the road of faith. When we worship God as he taught us and are confident that we are receiving his body and blood at the Eucharist, we act in faith, believing what he told us. Faith is the healing of our minds and of our vision. It allows us to see the world, our lives, and God truly. And we should have fierce allegiance to the invisible world which is revealed to us by the healing of our minds and the gift of faith. That gift of faith then is meant to be applied eucharistically and mystically to the church itself. We can, we can stumble all over ourselves here, everybody, and we can come into a worldly, faithless way of thinking about the church. When people ask the question, is the church going to survive, like with all that's happening around, with all the, of the things that trouble us, is the church going to survive or do you think it's just going to collapse? Or maybe it'll just shrink into almost nothing, but it'll still survive. And here's what we say then, because we, because we don't understand. We always quote then the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel when Jesus says that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. And then we think to ourselves, that means that no matter what happens, somehow magically, Jesus is going to keep the church going. But that's not truly what he means. He means something else, which if we saw it, everything comes clear, not just about the church, but about our belief in the Eucharist and about our lives. We can see the church in a worldly way when we think about it as sort of a, um, a voluntary association of people banded together for a common cause or as a bureaucratic structure which operates according to the same kind of political categories that other human political or bureaucratic structures uh, exist as a part of. Uh, we can see the church as a humanitarian organization which is primarily in the world to care for the poor, the sick, and the uneducated. We can see the church as an historical reality which grows and shrinks according to the vicissitudes of the world, getting bigger and smaller at various times and making its way in the world. Each of these ways of seeing the church has uh, perhaps a glimmer of truth, but each of them also is seriously reductionistic. And any of them taken as a whole is a massive and colossal intellectual error about what the church truly is. But what if we saw the church with faith? What if our vision opened up upon what the angels can see? What would we perceive then? Here is a poor attempt at what we would perceive then. If we could see the church as the angels see the church, we would see that the church is the new humanity, the redeemed people of God, sharing in the very life of God. 
The church is gathered around Christ as her bridegroom and her head. And the vast, vast, vast majority of the members of the church are already securely with God in everlasting life or making their way to him through a process of purification. The vast majority of the members of the church are already completely safe and secure in the everlasting kingdom, gazing upon and taking their life from God himself, not subject anymore to any suffering, injustice, discouragement, scandal, or death. Angels are members of the church, mighty, powerful beings battling against evil in all of their activity, powerful in worship, and in their aid to humans. If we looked a bit closer, we would glimpse that the Blessed Mother is there. Mary is present, not as an icicle queen, as Alexandre de Santis reminded us yesterday, not as an icicle queen. Mary is there as the queen of heaven, as the mother of the church, with great tenderness for all of those of us who are still struggling We stragglers, the apostles are members of the church. They govern the church, still ordering her life. The 12 apostles tower over the church, protecting her, interceding for her. In fact, all of the great ones through all of history are there cheering upon the scene that they see below them, granting strength, vigor to all of us who are also members of the church. And in every age, there's a thin veil between the invisible church and the visible church. And there's constant communion and communication that takes place um, uh, through that veil. And every generation passes from this side of the veil to the next. An everlasting harvest, meaning the church never gets smaller at all. It's always growing. It's always an ever-growing in every age. And the church in this time-space world, what's sometimes been called the church militant, is a colony of the heavenly kingdom, a colony of the heavenly church. It's an outpost behind enemy lines. And it operates as a kind of resistance movement constantly battling against evil, constantly purifying, constantly healing, constantly leavening a world which is so broken, so full of evil, but which God loved enough to save. And our work then is to engage in a great work of sabotage as part of this resistance movement, disabling evil at every turn. Smartly, thoughtfully, as Helen told us just now, thoughtfully, smartly, moving through the world with great allegiance to God, always, always with hope and trust. Because we know this, we stragglers, we members of the church who are still diseased and broken and suffering in the hospital, making our way to our true home, we are the least potent, least impressive, and smallest part of the church. But we're part of the church too. And we sing while we fight. Because we know that the church is safe and secure. And this is amazing. It makes the question, will the church survive, a ridiculous question. It's this fallen world that's not going to survive. The church will survive for sure. The church will survive for sure. And what it also means for us in terms of how we see our lives is this. As long as we don't give up, we always win. As long as we don't give up, we always win. This is an ironclad rule of the spiritual life. Because we are members of the church and because we're connected to that heavenly kingdom, as long as we don't throw in the towel, we will always prevail. This is why Jesus is so intent upon the question of perseverance. Don't grow weary in prayer, he says to his apostles, because you need to stay faithful. 
In staying faithful, we always win. The enemy knows this. The devil knows it. He knows that, 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 that he can't overcome us by beating us, by bludgeoning us. He can't overcome us by insulting us. He can't overcome us by any kind of pain or intimidation. The most that he can ever do by means of all those things is to get us to throw in the towel. That's his only chance at victory, to make us quit. But we won't quit. And so as a result, we'll always win. This is really important, everybody, because then when we think about the, the heavenly kingdom, we realize that God himself is the food of the kingdom of God. The wedding feast of the Lamb. We don't live for God. We live from God. My friend Barbara Davies, who I met in Lourdes years ago, used to tell me that we need to live from God and not for God. Highly successful people like you need to hear that too. We don't live for God. Stop trying to impress God with your life and all the good things that you do. You can't impress him. Anything that God needs you to do, he can do on his own without you. And by the way, you don't need to impress him. He's already knocked out by you. He's already head over heels for you. But we can live from God. We can live from God. Taking our life from him. When Pope Urban IV asked St. Thomas Aquinas to write the Mass of Corpus Domini, uh, St. Thomas came up with this very strange phrase, panis angelicus, for the Eucharist. The, the Eucharist is the bread of angels. What in the world could that possibly mean? Angels don't have bodies, they don't eat, they don't have bread. There's no such thing as bread for angels. And we're not angels, and so how are we supposed to eat the bread of angels? What it means is that in heaven, all those gathered around the throne feast upon God. And that the Eucharist in this world, the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord, is us enacting and participating in heavenly life even now. Pregustatum! St. Thomas says, a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. We feast upon God. You know, it's the opposite with the devils and in hell, isn't it? 1 Peter 5, 8, remember the devil prowls through the world looking for someone to devour. C.S. Lewis famously riffed on this in the Screwtape Letters. Remember this series of letters from Screwtape to his nephew Wormwood, Advice from one devil to another about the art of tempting humans to damnation. And uh, Screwtape reveals that in hell, the, the devils feast upon the damned and upon each other. They feast upon the damned and upon each other. Lewis wrote the Screwtape letters during the Second World War. Years later, he wrote an epilogue called Screwtape Proposes a Toast, um, which is uh, a veiled critique of American education. In, in, which, in which he, um, in which he in, in screw tape arises because he's giving the commencement address at the annual tempter's banquet from the tempting college of hell. <laughs> and, he, and he complains about the food. The first thing he does is he complains about the food. He said, oh my, oh, th this food is crap. He says, we've been feasting upon so much. There's much better quantity these days but the quality is much less. He says, what have they given us? A casserole of adulterers, a government worker with graft sauce, a union boss stuffed with sedition. He said, but most of these people that we've been eating on are undersexed morons who slithered and trickled into the wrong beds in response to sexy advertisements. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how the devil complains about what he has to eat. And so in respect to the mystery of the Eucharist and the mystery of divine life in the church and everlasting life feeding upon God, it's truly, brothers and sisters, it's eat or be eaten. It's eat or be eaten. We have to choose. We have to choose. Of course, we know what we choose. We choose to eat, to draw our nourishment from God himself, to approach the food that gives everlasting life. You know, um, now that I've been a priest for a couple of decades, one of the great joys of my life is to meet young priests, to meet this rising generation. They're so amazing. 
It's incredible. You know, in our little diocese in Bismarck, 60, 70,000 Catholics, we've had ordinations of five, six, seven a year. It's been amazing for us. Uh, we had an ordination last month, and we gathered all of the new priests of the Diocese of Bismarck in the last 15 years who have come through the University of Mary and took a picture. I almost exploded. I was so proud. And that's just the ones from the Diocese of Bismarck, not including uh, all the other dioceses, people who come and then go back, or the religious sisters. It's just very beautiful. And their formation that they're receiving in seminary is so superior to the formation that I received all those years ago. I had a great seminary formation, but I'm telling you, they're being deeply formed. They're drinking deeply of the spiritual life. It's very beautiful. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I was back to the parish where I used to be a pastor for a couple of years before I came to the University of Mary. I was a week and a half, two weeks ago, back in Kildare, North Dakota. That's a real town, Kildare. It's in the middle of, it's in the middle of um, uh, cowboy country. And um, I was there for the funeral of a father of 12 children who died of a massive heart attack at the age of 67. And the young pastor there, my successor as the pastor of that parish, is such a good priest. He gave one of the most moving sermons that I've ever heard in my life. He spoke directly to the family, starting with the children, and he quoted the 68th Psalm, and he said, remember that God is the father of the fatherless. When you sense that you're fatherless, remember that God is the father of the fatherless. And then he turned to their mother and he said, in the same psalm, says that God is the protector of widows. He guards their hearts. He guards their minds. He guards their lives. He's the protector of widows. And then he said to all of you, to his children, to his wife, to all of his friends, when you grow angry that he was taken, when you become discouraged by his death, come into the church and look to the middle. And I looked to the middle, and there it was. It's a very plain church that I had in Kildare. Um, but in the middle is the most beautiful crucifix. The, the body of Jesus is so masterfully depicted, and then the cross itself is inlaid wood as though it was purchased like in Sorrento or something. Very beautiful, and underneath an oversized tabernacle, and I remembered all of the hours that I had spent praying there during those carefree years when I was a, a pastor. <laughs> and, and he said, when you become discouraged at his death, the death of your dad, of your husband, of your dear friend, come into the church and look there to the middle of the church, and there what we do is we stare death in the face. And I was bowled over by that. And I looked, and it's true, on the crucifix in the tabernacle, we stare death in the face because the Eucharist is how we're going to get out of here alive. And then uh, I went back just about a week before that to the pro-cathedral in Bismarck, which is the church, St. Mary's, which is the church that my parents were married in 50 years ago this December. And they were married in the early 1970s. That whole church, which was the oldest church in Bismarck, had been whitewashed. Their wedding photos, which we'll share when the anniversary comes, are beige, beige, beige. But this young pastor, who's a great evangelist, has just finished renovating the whole church. And so I was there for the dedication of it. And I was looking around, and I was just in, in, in awe of how beautiful it was, the stencil work and the statues and the altar. And it was just beautiful. But at the end of Mass, he got up, and he spoke to his people from his heart, his voice choked with emotion. And he said, I love you so much. And uh, I'm so pleased that you're all here, that you filled this church for the rededication of your parish. And the parish exists for you. And the, parish, the church in this parish loves you. But I want to remind you of something. We don't just exist for you. A parish also, we also exist for all those who aren't here, but should be here. We also exist for all those who don't know that they should be here, who don't know how to find what they're looking for. The parish exists for all those who should be here. We have to remember that too. This is why we're here, gathered together 
talking about faith and about God and the things of God during these days together. We're here not just for ourselves. We're here for all those others too who we're called to witness to as well. We stand for them. We pray for them. And we keep our minds clear about the invisible world for them because we know that as beautiful as all of this is, as wonderful as the great food and the sumptuous wine is, none of it's worth anything. We're not stupid idiots. We don't value these kinds of things. This whole place has no value at all. It's all passing away. It's all turning to dust. Tim Bush may as well just give it to the University of Mary. <laughs> no. We, we value things truly. We see things as they really are. And what do we hang on to when all of this passes away? What do we hold on to when everything else turns to ashes? We hold on to what, with all our might, to what looks for all the world like a small piece of bread. But we know the secret about it. We know that it's the bread, the food, that gives eternal life. Thanks for listening.